All right, gang. Uh, Mass 6500. We're going to review diagnostics uh, in, in this video. And for, for, uh, for those of you, well, we just uh, took uh, a midterm exam. And uh, I haven't graded them all yet, but I've glanced through them. Um, some of them are really good. Some of them uh, aren't. Um, yeah, you know, some, I, I'm just convinced some people just aren't watching the videos the way you're supposed to. Um, you know, we're, we're all teachers, and we have certain expectations of our students, whether it's a graduate um, class or undergraduate class or high school or middle school or whatever, and one of those expectations is that our students come to class. Well, this equivalent of coming to class at the graduate level is, uh, is watching the videos. And as I told early on, uh, or I uh, told you early on, the ex expectations are to watch the videos, take notes, just like you would uh, if you were uh, attending a class on campus. And, that, and that's the way this works. And, um, um, you know, it's, some of you are doing a great job. I mean, you're, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do and uh, so on and so forth. But... Uh, you know, uh, I, I just, I don't know, I'm just not convinced that everyone is. Um, you know, what, uh, well, uh, I, I guess uh, enough of that. So anyway, the good news, okay, the good news is this. Uh, we start uh, kind of a review today. We're going to get into uh, uh, polynomial regression and uh, regression with qualitative predictors. We're going to look at that a little bit more than uh, just from a matrix approach. Uh, we're going to look at uh, kind of the mathematics behind that. Um, we're going to look at interactions between quantitative and qualitative variables. But uh, in order to really get to where I want to get to in that part, we needed to step back a little bit and uh, you know, it, uh, there's something called a Brown Forsyth method. I don't think we've ever uh, talked about that. So, so guys, uh, if the course has been kind of hard for you, this that's kind of <clears throat> this is kind of good news because we're going to step back today and look at some uh, at, at some very very uh, uh, you know basic ideas in simple linear regression. So, uh, guys, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what uh, what what we want to do here is we want to uh, accomplish uh, looking at some uh, basic um, remedial and diagnostic procedures. Okay. Um, now, um, let's start out by let's just saying, um, you know, just in general that uh, we we have some data that we've collected and we'd like to fit a linear model to this. And uh, you know we, we do what uh, we would we would expect to. We'd probably uh, <clears throat> you know either calculate the coefficients by hand or jump on R and uh, do it the easy way. So uh, what we know from this is the technology, uh, even the graphing calculator, uh, uh, yeah. I'm not talented enough to, to write and talk. Uh, technology could perform this uh, uh, very, very easily. In, the, in other words, technology uh, would let us uh, fit a model, uh, except in uh, we saw rare cases of uh, extreme multicollinearity uh, a couple of videos ago that uh, the, uh, uh, in, in the multivariate, the multiple regression situation, uh, it didn't uh, uh, do, do a very good job of fitting the model. but. Uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we could, we could fit a model, but, uh, you know, there's always an underlying question. Uh, is our model appropriate? And, uh, you know, uh, we have certain assumptions that, 
that uh, we have to uh, have met when we uh, perform simple linear regression. Uh, the first assumption is we have to have linearity. Uh, if we have a uh, relationship that looks like this, something that looks like this, well, our, our graphing calculator, whatever it may be, it'll let us fit a linear model to the, uh, to, to the relationship between x and y. Now, even though we clearly can eyeball it and see that linearity uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, not, uh, uh, is not given. In other words, we would probably need to look for some other model that's not a straight line that would better fit the model. So some of the stuff we can, like linearity, we could, we could eyeball. Um, another basic requirement. Uh, let's get you down here where we can, where we can see is uh, the normality uh, of the error terms. We want equal variances of our error terms across levels of x. So guys, at the end of the day, the, you know, the simple linear regression model that we are uh, uh, you know, building on uh, assumes the following. Uh, it, soon, it assumes that for the data that we've collected, they have uh, a, a, a form of linearity. And for each level of x, and we'll just call this x1, that the responses of y are normally distributed with an expected value of what we'll call mu sub y at the level of x1. And for each of these levels, it's hard to draw normal distribution sideways, but kind of bear with me. Uh, each of these have uh, normality of error terms. Each of these have equal variances. In other words, out here somewhere, maybe uh, level X, uh, you know, whatever it may be, uh, we don't have a situation where we have a distribution of errors that's not normally distributed. It would be, you know, kind of severely positively skewed uh, in, uh, in, that, uh, in, in that situation right there. So guys, again, it's, uh, you know, kind of enjoy this. Uh, we've been doing some, some pretty challenging stuff in terms of multicollinearity and uh, you know, these, this extra sum of squares thing that we've been looking at. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're stepping back to build a more solid foundation for where we're, we're getting ready to go in terms of, <laughs> again, some, some more complicated uh, 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 topics that uh, we'll, we'll get to uh, uh, pretty soon. So guys, uh, at the end of the day, the goal of the probably the next two videos, uh, we're going to look at uh, simple graphs. That allows us to test the appropriateness of a linear model. Uh, we're also going to, and this will probably be uh, in the next video, uh, I'm going to present to you some formal tests that we can use to test certain characteristics of a simple linear regression model. And keep in mind that this is all in the context of the simple linear regression model where we have uh, a single predictor, but these things clearly extend into the multiple regression case. And uh, third thing I'm going to teach you uh, is to, to look at some accommodations So what happens when we actually violate these things? What if we don't have equal variance? What if we don't have normality? Uh, what if we have outliers in our predictor variable? Uh, uh, you know, what do we do there? What kind of uh, measures can we make uh, that uh, allows us to, uh, to go ahead with the simple linear regression model? So, so guys, again, keep in, keep in mind here, we're looking at the simple linear regression case, but... Um, 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 we, um, 
it, it, it clearly extends into the multiple regression case. Now, the first thing I want to look at uh, is let's pull up a data set. And there's going to be a data set uh, uh, on Blackboard that's called Simple Linear Regression, I think, Data. So uh, I'm going to go get that. So um, first thing I need to do is oh interesting. Won't allow me to minimize this. Um, well, okay. Very interesting. Let's hide it and see what happens. Okay, there's a simple linear regression uh, data.csv that, um, uh, that, that I'm going to use. Well, I've got R open, and let's just go ahead and get this thing uh, opened. I should have already done that, but I didn't. Too bad I don't have some uh, music for you. And you'll see when we uh, get this all typed in that we've just got a very harmless data set here. Uh, sample size 25, relatively small. So guys, one of the very first things that we'd want to look at is we'd want to focus on our x variable. So uh, first of all, um, let me go back to, uh, so we can get our notes going here. Uh, first thing I'd want to do um, is uh, focus on the predictor or predictors once we extend this into uh, uh, the multiple regression case. And again, guys, it, it, after what you guys have been through so far, uh, stepping back here is going to be, be a, probably a welcome relief for some of you. But uh, the reason I'm doing this is we need a really thorough understanding of these, uh, these basic uh, ideas uh, when we go on to, uh, to, to some other stuff. Uh, so uh, focus on our predictor. So uh, what I want to do in this case is just uh, put all my focus on uh, on X, as I've called it um, uh, in uh, uh, the data set. And the kinds of things I'd want to look at here are just uh, simply a dot plot. Uh, these things work uh, really, really well if you have small data. Uh, something else I'd want to look at is I want to look at a histogram. This works well when we have large data. And typically, I think of large data, 50 or higher, dot plot, uh, small data, you know, so something less than that. And then uh, another plot that uh, looks really well is uh, a box plot, uh, which also is, uh, is kind of uh, good for, for large data. So guys, uh, you know, what are we looking for here? kinds of things are we looking for? We're looking for outliers. Are there any x values that may inappropriately influence our model? Now, I know I've told you the story before, but we did, I was, uh, served on the doctoral dissertation committee, um, oh, I don't know, a couple, three years ago, uh, at Southeast Nova University in Florida. And uh, we had a guy, uh, subject number 32, uh, who um, just, just completely uh, uh, had, a, had a big time effect on, on what we were trying to do. Uh, so guys, uh, you know, to do that, uh, let's, let's just uh, you know, kind of keep it simple here. So, uh, you know, the first thing we might uh, do is a, uh, 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 the uh, dot plot. And I don't know why in the world that uh, R just didn't call it a dot plot, but they didn't. They called it a dot chart. 
And uh, we've got pretty relatively larger sample size here, so this is probably not going to be uh, anything too much of interest. Uh, dot plots uh, typically are better when we have a lot of repeated data and small, uh, a small sample size. So anyway, there's one of those, and I don't really think it's appropriate for what we've got here. Uh, a histogram for X. Uh, uh, does it appear again that there's any um, uh, extremely small, large values? And it doesn't seem that there is to me. Stop it. And uh, my favorite uh, that I like is to look at a box plot. And, uh, you know, a box plot gives you uh, indication of symmetry, and a box plot will show outliers. Now, if you're not into the vertical box plots, uh, I don't know if, if you care about this or not, but I'm going to show you. Uh, you could do a horizontal box plot uh, like this. I kind of prefer the horizontal box plot, uh, to be honest with you, but, uh, uh, you know, typically when I care about box plots, when I really, really care about them is when I'm uh, reporting something, and I just tend to look at the, the way we're reporting things and how it kind of fits into the... Uh, uh, you know, into into the body of uh, the presentation. So guys, uh, what you should see now is that uh, our focus on uh, on examining X is uh, really straightforward. Now, you may think, well, the next thing we should do is focus on why. Uh, but we don't here because uh, uh, the, the focus on why, the diagnostics on why, really aren't useful uh, because y is a function of x, so y depends on x. So instead of focusing on y, we focus on our residuals. Now guys, as you uh, know, residuals are a very, play a very, very, very important role in diagnostics. In fact, there's uh, quite, quite a few diagnostics we're going to look at that depend on, uh, on, uh, on the errors. Uh, guys, remember that uh, our errors are just the uh, observed value minus the predicted value. Again, after the stuff that uh, <laughs> you've been through, stepping back and doing some easy stuff, uh, is probably a uh, 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 welcome relief. Well, anyway, guys, uh, our diagnostic on why, uh, our diagnostics on why, actually, uh, we do that through an examination of the residuals, not actually looking at why uh, directly. So, guys, uh, just recall that our errors uh, follow some, uh, some certain properties. Uh, we want independent uh, uh, errors. Uh, we want the errors to be normal. We want our errors to be random. And we want uh, the mean of the uh, uh, errors to be zero. And we want constant variance. Okay, constant variance means we don't have any wackiness at each level of, uh, of X of our predictor. We don't have uh, uh, normal distributions at that level that have different, uh, different uh, shapes. Okay, so uh, one of the most important uh, aspects uh, uh, to uh, determine the appropriateness of a model uh, is to look at the errors. Uh, so we know a couple things. Um, uh, the, uh, the mean of our errors which we can let uh, be E bar uh, is the sum of the errors divided by N which is equal to zero and we know that the variance of our E sub I's uh, is um, uh, 
and we have two degrees of freedom because we t had two estimates. Uh, but uh, we know that the, the mean is equal to zero, so this uh, very nicely uh, simplifies to this. Uh, we should know by now that this is the sum of squares for the air. And still over n minus 2. And of course, this, enough space there, guys, uh, is given as the mean square error term. So uh, those are things I expect you to know, uh, but it's, it's kind of nice sometimes to step back and, uh, and uh, you know, once you've got into big boy, big girl stuff, sometimes it, uh, it makes the easier stuff, that uh, the basics that you should know, uh, kind of you know, get uh, uh, permanently tattooed to the brain. Okay. So uh, guys, if our model is a, uh, appropriate... then uh, uh, we know that the uh, expected value of the mean square error uh, is uh, equal to the, uh, the population variance uh, of the residuals. And all this tells us some big old fancy terminology. Uh, well, I don't know about how big and fancy. It's something that we should have uh, 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 kind of roll off our tongue uh, tongues pretty easily is that the mean square error, uh, if our model is appropriate, is an unbiased estimator of the uh, uh, of the uh, population variance. Now, uh, clearly, our residuals are uh, not independent. Uh, clearly, they are they rely on uh, the fitted values, which are, are y hat. So uh, there are certain constraints. You know, I'm always thinking about uh, final exam questions and uh, some of this basic stuff. Uh, you know, you're gonna you're gonna see it. Okay, so I've lost my track here. <laughs> All right, uh, we know that the sum of the errors uh, has to be equal to zero. And actually, something you've seen before too is that the product of our x terms uh, and uh, uh, product of uh, our x terms times the errors, the sum of those uh, has to be equal to zero. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, when n is large, uh, you know, most of this is what I would call a given. And really, I'm not even sure, uh, you know, it needs to be tested under, uh, under certain situations. All right. Uh, Guys, something else that we uh, uh, need to need to reconsider are um, the z scores for our residuals, and um, you know, as you would expect, uh, a z score for a particular error term for a particular uh, uh, residual is just uh, that value. Uh, minus uh, the mean of the uh, the errors over the uh, standard deviation. Well, guys, this simplifies to uh, this term, and since the mean of the errors is equal to zero, uh, we end up getting uh, this now. Uh, the complexity of, uh, of finding z-scores is uh, that the, uh, the standard deviation varies from, uh, from uh, uh, residuals to residuals. Uh, so it's not a stable measure, but uh, the square root of the mean square error should give us a pretty good approximation uh, of this value. And some books uh, actually call this uh, uh, approximated standardized values or approximated z-scores. I've even seen it called semi-z-scores, uh, semi semi-studentized, I guess, uh, uh, would be uh, a way of, uh, of actually looking at. All right, gang. Um, let's get into the uh, nuts and bolts of what we should have. Uh, residuals should have Uh, 
uh, six uh, features. Okay, first thing. Uh, they help us, um, I, I didn't say that correctly, residuals uh, help us examine uh, six features. So residuals help us examine the linearity. <clears throat> They help us examine constant error variance. They help us examine the independence uh, of our errors. I'm afraid I'm going to forget one. Uh, uh, they help us uh, examine the effect of outliers. They help us address, examine uh, the uh, normal distribution assumption. <laughs> oh, goodness. And uh, I don't remember the sixth one. Oh, okay. okay. If uh, um, they help us uh, examine uh, if uh, one uh, or possibly more predictors uh, have been omitted. Uh, so let's say deleted from our model. Uh, then uh, it, uh, it helps us uh, address, I guess, uh, whether or not those things should have been deleted. Uh, you know, we're always trying to get the kind of the most effective model um, that we can uh, uh, that we can get uh, with with the least number of predictors, because uh, there's no need having a predictor. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, a predictor in our model if it uh, has no uh, uh, kind of no value. Now, there are seven uh, seven graphs. Uh, that uh, I want you guys to have on your radar. And again, this is gonna be more important when we get into the bigger boy, bigger girl stuff. But uh, the most, uh, you know, the, the simplest graph is to just look at the residuals over the, um, and actually that's gonna be like this because we're gonna have positive residuals and negative residuals. Uh, another graph that I want you to have um, uh, on your radar is a graph of the residual squared over our X. Another graph uh, that I want you to uh, consider is the residuals over our uh, predicted values. Uh, sometimes if we have uh, data that's collected over time, uh, we may want to look at um, uh, our residuals uh, over time. Uh, a fifth um, Uh, model that we want to look at uh, are the residuals uh, over omitted values of X or uh, I should say omitted uh, predictor value predictor variables and uh, something else that's uh, often had handy
is of course a box plot uh, of our residuals. And guys, finally one that um, that almost every single paper that um, that presents uh, multiple regression uh, uh, analysis uh, is something called a QQ plot. In a QQ plot, uh, you know, typically uh, will uh, examine um, our um, uh, standardized uh, residuals uh, over our original uh, x value. So, guys, let's uh, let's get out of here and show you show you how to to manage some data now. I got, I got to confess to you, there's uh, a couple of reasons I wanted to step back and do this. Uh, I feel in some, some cases we've kind of built a house on sand uh, with some of you. Um, uh, I think the opportunity to, to learn it has been there, but uh, uh, maybe I haven't been as persistent in, 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 in enforcing the basics as uh, maybe I should have been. I don't know. Um, I guess it's, uh, it's all dependent on the student. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I'd like to do in, in kind of getting you guys uh, thinking also about uh, not only about regression, but getting into your, um, 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 your final, uh, your master's thesis, uh, is very, very likely that some of you are going to be using uh, multiple regression uh, as a statistical technique in your master's thesis. And uh, if so, you're, you're clearly going to have to include a diagnostics uh, session and you could even have to have to uh, come up with some re remedial measures where if uh, uh, assumptions are severely violated then you may have to make some transformations on your on your uh, data but uh, so uh, well, you know that, that's kind of to kind of where uh, this is uh, this is all headed so uh, guys what I would want to do first of all is just go ahead and run a model and uh, we should be really good at <laughs> at this by now. And uh, I would want to look at a summary of my model to um, to get my coefficient output. So it looks like in this situation that the uh, predictor x is statistically significant at the 0 0.001 level. Uh, I may also like to look at the overall model. Uh, now, typically, I don't care about this when. Uh, uh, we don't have multiple predictors, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, there's the uh, there's the ANOVA table. Now, the next thing I'd want to do is I'd want to look at the fitted values, and uh, that's really sweet. Uh, uh, R has a command uh, for fitted, and the next thing I'd want to look at look at are the residuals. And R also has a command for those called R-E-S-I-D. Um, there is also uh, a way to create the standardized residuals. And uh, uh, to do those, I'm just going to call those uh, S-T-R-E-S. And... Uh, To do that, we just do our standard uh, of the model. Now, at this stage of the game, I would probably want to organize things and create a new data frame. And I'd like to include my X, I'd like to include my Y, I'd like to include my fit, my residuals, and my standardized residuals, okay? So now if I come in with data two, you can see that I've got the information that's really important to me as I move forward and uh, perform uh, uh, basic diagnostics to see if uh, a linear model is indeed uh, appropriate for describing the relationship between X and Y. Okay. Uh, now, one of the first things I'd want to look at uh, back, uh, you know, as I said before, uh, let me get my, my notes here. Uh, I'd like to look at a uh, plot of the residuals over my original X. So, uh, so I want the residuals over my original X. 
And what am I looking for here? Uh, you know, it's one thing uh, I found when I'm sitting in a, in a classroom and it's an academic exercise, uh, you know, it's, not as a, it's important, obviously, because I always wanted to make A's and, 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 and do well. But uh, when you get this kind of situation on something that you're putting your name on that's going out there for potential publication, uh, man, these things, these things take on a completely new meaning. So... Uh, you know, what would you look at here when, 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 the, uh, when the chips are down, if you will, to use a... Uh, what you're looking at, looking at is you're looking at uh, you don't want any patterns. You want complete randomness. So you don't want anything that looks like a U-shaped. And you don't want anything that has a fanning out effect. Because if you look at your levels from 20 to 40 and all the, uh, the sub-levels between... If you look at the, the residuals, the spread of the residuals... Now, for example, let's come in here to about, uh, oh, probably about 88. We can look at the variance of the residuals at that particular level by looking at the difference from the low to the high. We don't want any drastic difference in the air variances across levels. In other words, we don't want to see a situation where it actually fans out. And let me, uh, let me go back and, and, and give you an illustration of something that we don't want to see. Uh, you know, we don't want to see in this of our X over our residuals. You know, we don't want to see... A situation like this where we have a fanning out because if we have this fanning out effect and that tells me at that particular level that the variance in the residuals is nowhere near the error uh, the variance of the residuals uh, at that particular level so uh, it allows us to focus on things like that which ultimately you know, turn out to be extremely important um, Another thing that uh, we would probably want to look at uh, would be uh, to, to look at the, um, uh, the residual squared. So um, I would do a plot of uh, the residuals uh, squared uh, over my x. And uh, what this allows us to do is allows us to take out the, the positive and the negative values, and uh, uh, it, it allows us to just to compare the um, well, compare compare the values uh, uh, when when they're squared. So, you know, we can look at uh, at this right here, and there seems to be this 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 data point that I'm pointing out here uh, at a level of about thirty. Uh, seems to be a potential uh, for investigation. So I may want to get, and we're going to look at this uh, in the next video probably. We may get, I don't know, we may have time to get to it in this video. It just depends on how time's working. Uh, we, we may want to investigate the, the effects of our model without that observation. Uh, another uh, plot that we want to examine would be the residuals over our fitted value. Uh, our y hat, and uh, in this situation, again, we're looking for what we, uh, you know, we're looking for randomness. We're looking uh, for no discernible patterns, and we don't see any fanning out of uh, uh, indication of uh, error variance. Uh, these data really don't set up well for an examination of residuals over time, uh, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, Let's say, for example, that we uh, uh, had reason to suspect that uh, uh, we have these data down here we'd like to omit. Now, what I may want to do there is I uh, would probably want to look at a plot of the residuals uh, over... the data, but only including cases uh, 1 through 19. Okay, that's not going to allow me to do that. Uh, why not? Um, 
All right, let's do this. So if I want to look at the uh, residuals uh, over uh, X, but I want my data to be data frame, I'm sorry, data two, but I only want to include values. It's not going to let me do that. Why not? Undefined column selected. Okay. Um, And we want variables, what, uh, the first one, and okay, so um, guys, this is, uh, uh, shouldn't include, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, yeah, that's 19. So that's what that does, uh, is that allows us to examine uh, just for, uh, say, the first uh, first 19 in, in this situation. So it's a clever way. If we've got the reason to suspect that um, we have some values that are causing some problems, we might want to uh, put those down uh, at the bottom of our data set so we can eliminate uh, uh, eliminate those. Uh, guys, uh, box plot uh, of our residuals are always something that I want to look at. Uh, again, looking for features such as uh, symmetry and outliers. And guys, finally, we want to look at a QQ plot. And um, uh, a QQ plot, again, is something that um, uh, it's called a normal PP plot. Uh, in this in this scenario, this situation, but uh, what this will look like, it'll uh, look like. Uh, uh, well, I tell you what, let's just uh, let's just create one. Uh, we can uh, uh, create a QQ line of our standardized residuals. I'm sorry, that's not what we wanted. We want a QQ plot of our standardized residuals. See, what did I want? I want my. Uh... Oh, I'm losing my mind here, guys. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I was uh, distracted by something. Uh... <laughs> Goodness gracious, that is sad. All right, guys, anyway, we'd want our standardized residuals uh, uh, over our uh, fitted values. And uh, what we're looking for here is we're looking for. Um, um, uh, you know, how well do these things fit a diagonal line? So the more variation that we have uh, across this line uh, just uh, gives us an indication that the, the normality assumption uh, uh, has been violated. So uh, guys, this is, uh, this is like textbook here. This is exactly what you would want to see in terms of checking the diagnostics for um, uh, the normality assumption of your errors. All right. Well, guys, that's about, uh, I've been looking at the clock here. It looks like this is where I want to, uh, or I need to end this video. So, uh, guys, uh, hopefully this, this was a welcome relief from, uh, you know, because we're, you know, again, stepping back. Most of this was a uh, review, so uh, hopefully I haven't bored you too much. So, uh, guys, that's, uh, that's it. That's the end.